from that one twenty five. All righty, lads and ladies, we are back. Um, today we're going to continue where we left off last time. Um, we talked about polynomials, a pretty healthy amount. I wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about polynomials. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page with some factoring tricks. And then we're going to move forwards. Um, quick look at the syllabus just to make sure we're kind of where we ought to be, but I think we're right on track. So we'll go ahead and have the screen share everything else together. All right, uh, this is you guys. So uh, finding polynomials. Oh, that's right. So we had our test here. We had to bump things back a little bit because we had our test. So uh, we are going to have to push some of this to next week. But today we'll definitely finish 3.2. We'll talk about 3.3. Um, and then 3.4, 3.5. These are our neat sections. They do move a little quick, but I don't, I don't expect to cram all of this in today. Um, so some of that's going to have to move to next week. That's okay. This is MAC 1140 pre calculus. It's a lecture. And today is the 15th of uh, July. Professor, I have a question. Sure. Is it possible to go over number 11 and 12 on the homework before we start? Um, we can look at a problem or two. Thank you. So we're going to finish section 3.2, which is the section on polynomials. And their graphs. Um, and we're going to talk about dividing polynomials. Uh, this is section 3.3. If there's time, we may hit a little bit of three, four, and three, five. Um, there's not really anything, like I said, crazy in here. It's really just more of the same um, kind of practice factoring, finding roots. So we'll we'll feel it out, but we may get to a bit of three, four, and three, five. Okay. Uh, I said before we get into the other stuff, we want to see was it twelve and thirteen. 11 and 12. 11 and 12, sorry. And that's from uh, homework four? Yeah, it's based off the completing the square with uh, fractions. Okay, yeah, we have to. Um, so here in number 11, we've got a quadratic, negative 3x squared plus 6x minus 1. Your number here would be different. We want to put this in standard form. Remember, by standard form, they mean vertex form, the a times x minus h squared plus k. Uh, find the vertex, find the intercepts, All right, and then draw the graph, give the domain of range. I think um, we can move through this reasonably quickly. I mean, not explicitly do each step, but negative three x squared. So four more, four problem number. X, negative three x squared plus six x minus one. Okay. So we're going to put this into the standard or vertex form. And the way we do that is by completing the square. So remember our first step is to force factor out this lead coefficient. So I'm going to bring negative 3 out, factor of negative 3 out. That means that lead term will become x squared. 6x divided by negative 3 is negative 2x. And then negative 1 divided by negative 3 is plus 1 third. So this is how I would get started here. And then we look at these first two terms, right? We're going to add and subtract something to these so that we can factor the result as a perfect square. To cook up our magic number, we take this guy, divide by 2, and square it. So 
So that's negative two divided by two squared, uh, which is one. Right? It's negative one all squared. So I come back over here and I add and subtract that magic number right after the x term. So I have right here plus one, minus one, and then we have a plus one for the still chalk. And the nice thing about this is that these three terms are guaranteed now to factor as a perfect square. So x squared minus 2x plus 1, that's uh, x minus 1 quantity squared. It's x minus 1 times x minus 1. So this is x minus 1 quantity squared. It's these first three. And then I still have minus 1 plus 1 third. And it's up to you if you want to kind of combine these and then redistribute the three, or you want to redistribute the three and then combine these. If you're intimidated by the fractions, you can always redistribute first. Um, but positive one third minus four thirds would be negative. We'll do it like this, just for the fun of this. So remember this negative one, that's the same as negative three thirds. Negative three thirds plus one third is negative two thirds. And then distributing the three, we get negative three quantity x minus one squared plus two. So that's our guy here in uh, what your book calls standard form and most people call vertex form. So you can see that the vertex, that point h comma k, this number right here is h, so x minus h, so h is one. This number right here is k, so k is 2. Uh, remember that there's a negative built into the formula, right? It's x minus h squared, so this guy, uh, h is positive. But there's not a minus sign built into the k part, so k here is positive 2. Uh, the fact that a is negative 3 tells me that the parabola is going to open down. So I could sketch a little graph here. And then my vertex is going to be right here at 1, 2. And then if we just go plug in things, uh, not plug in things. if we go ahead and, and draw a graph, it's going to be a parabola like this. I know it's going to be like a, a steep, vertically stretched parabola because I'm thinking about the transformations. right? So this negative 3, this does a couple things. If you think of this as a transformation of x squared, you take regular x squared, you shift it to the right one unit, um, you flip it over vertically and stretch it out by a factor of three, and then you bump it up two units. So translate right one, flip and stretch, then bump up by two. That gets us this. So here's our graph. We can state the domain and range. This being a polynomial, the domain, domain of all polynomials is negative infinity to infinity. The range, we do need the graph for that, is um, the set of all the y values. So same game we've done in the beginning of the semester. If you smoosh the graph onto the y-axis, you see the range here. Negative infinity up to and including two. I think that's most of the stuff we wanted here, right? Oh, we also wanted um, x and y-intercepts. Y-intercept is pretty easy to get from this guy. Um, you can get it from any of these, but plug in x equals 0. That's always how you get your y-intercept. Uh, it's always the point 0, comma, f of 0. And here, f of 0, I think it's easiest to see from this first version, negative 3 times 0 squared plus 6 times 0 minus 1 is negative 1. Um, so that's the point 0, comma, negative 1. The x-intercepts we have to work for a little bit. You have choices. You could try to factor this. That's an option. Or um, you could use this form and solve by kind of setting equal to 0, taking square roots after isolating the x minus 1 term. That's what I'll do. Or if you really are a masochist, you could use the quadratic formula on this. Um, but these always come from setting f of x equal to 0 and then solving. So in this case, 
I'm going to put the zero on the left because it just makes life a little easier. We have zero equals negative three times x minus one squared plus two. I'm going to add this whole piece over. That'll give me three times quantity x minus one squared equals two. Then I'll divide both sides by three and I get x minus one squared is equal to two thirds. I'll take it over here. So taking square roots, we get x minus one is equal to plus and minus the square root of two thirds, which means our x intercepts are going to come from one plus one. I'm just going to add one to both sides, one plus or minus the square root of two thirds. And those are the x intercepts. So one of them is one minus the square root of two thirds, comma zero. And the other is one plus the square root of two thirds, comma zero. Just like y intercepts are always at the point zero, comma f of zero. X intercepts are always of the point like, you know, X1, comma, uh, X1, comma, zero, and X2, comma, zero. All right, but like X1 and X2 are the two things you get either from the quadratic formula, from factoring, or by solving like this. So I think that is, that is not everything we wanted for this problem, right? And kind of the magic, the by far the, the easiest way to get all of these things, to get the graph, to get um, the intercepts, the vertex, all that information, domain and range, is from this guy. So that's why we, we like to put them into this formula or into this form. From this form, it's very easy to see the graph. Graph comes as a transformation of x squared. Um, and all of this other stuff either follows from this algebra form or from the graph. Number 12, I'll, I'll take a look at if it's substantially different, but if it is um, more or less the same thing. Let me tell you what, I'll go ahead and, and get the first part here, and then we can see. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you guys to, to work the rest of it out from the, the standard form. Is the completing the square practice is good. So same sort of thing. Here, f of x is negative 4x squared minus 12x plus 4. And uh, again, I factor out the lead coefficient first. This is negative 4 times x squared. Uh, 12x, if I divide this by negative 4, I get plus 3x. And then the plus 4, if I divide that by negative 4, I get minus 1. So I first up, always factor out that lead coefficient, make the lead coefficient 1. And then everything else proceeds as it did before. Only now, my b over 2 squared, that magic number, um, that's three halves squared, which is nine fourths. So I've got here x squared plus three x plus nine fourths minus nine fourths minus one. And in some of these cases like this, it can be a little bit hard to see how this factors. But the good news, you may have noticed the pattern, this guy actually tells you um, how this is going to factor, right? So it's always going to be x plus kind of the inside here um, that, that you need for your, uh, your factor. Or if you want to think about it, you can get there just as well. You need two numbers that multiply to give 9 over 4 and add up to positive 3. So two numbers that multiply to 9 over 4. Well, you know you're looking for a perfect square. So it's 3 halves times 3 halves. And then you can check in your head or if you want to write it down, is 3 halves plus 3 halves equal to 3? Well, yeah, it's 6 halves, which is 3. So this is x plus 3 halves quantity squared. But it's not a coincidence, and it will always be the case that it's the inside of this thing. And then you still got your minus 9 fourths minus 1. 
9 fourths uh, and 1. 1 is 4 fourths. So that's negative 9 fourths minus 4 fourths, which is negative 13 fourths. This is negative 4 times if the x plus 3 has only squared. And then both of these are negative, right? Uh, so the 9 and the 4, so 13. So 13. And then distributing the 4, we've got negative 4 times quantity x plus 3 halves squared plus 13. And then from here, we could draw our graph. We could find domain ranges, we could find means and maxes, we could find all the things that we want. But on that, that whole procedure, finding intercepts, means, max is exactly the same as it was on the last problem. So I'm going to leave it at, at this step for our purposes today. Any questions on this step or the, or the previous? So then, last time, let's see. remember there was something. Oh yeah, I just wanted to show you guys some factoring tricks before we leave polynomial land. Uh, we covered everything I would want to want to say about polynomials, um, except for some factoring tricks. Um, so wrapping up section three point two. Here are some useful factoring tricks. First, we need to know how to factor quadratics, right? That's that is a thing. So let me see if I can find an example that's a little bit challenging. Um, how to factor harder quadratics. So we've, we've covered how to factor quadratics when the coefficient, the lead coefficient is one. Um, but what if the lead coefficient isn't one? How do we factor those? This is called the AC method. I'm going to teach it to you through an example. I'm going to factor p of x equals 6x squared. Or, sorry, let's do um, 2x squared. Yeah, we'll do that. 2x squared minus 5x plus 3. So here's the trick. It's just like what we've been doing, where you look at the, uh, you, you need to kind of find two numbers that satisfy a pair of conditions. Uh, first, you multiply a and c. So remember, a is the lead coefficient of the quadratic. This only works for quadratics. Lead coefficient times the constant term. So here, a c is 2 times negative 3. Negative six, and then you find two numbers that satisfy the following conditions. One, they have to add to be the middle term, and two, they have to multiply to AC, that number from the first step. So here, a times c is negative 6, b is negative 5. So I want two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add up to negative 5. Can we think of two such numbers? Five and six. 
So then you would be negative um, six and five, or negative six and one. Yeah, negative, negative six and positive one will do that. Those multiply to give negative six, and they also do add up to negative five. So um, here are our special numbers, negative six, positive one. Then, and this is the cool step, you rewrite a middle term, which remember we call the linear term, using those two numbers. What do I mean by that? Well, remember these things add up to b. So I can write for p of x, 2x squared, plus 1x minus 6x minus 3. So this middle term, negative 5x, I'm writing as plus 1x minus 6x. That's the purpose of finding these. And then your last step here is to factor by grouping, which is one of the things I wanted to show you guys today. So, um, for quadratics factored to the AC method, the factor by grouping step will always work out great. You can also use this when working with cubic polynomials or some higher order polynomials, degree three, four, five polynomials, um, but it won't always work there. So what you wanna do to factor by grouping is look for kind of two groups that you suspect share a factor. You'll pull the largest common factor out of each group and then see if what's left over is indeed a shared factor. Let me show you what I mean. So here, p of x, my polynomial is 2x squared plus x, I'm not writing the one, minus 6x minus 3. From the first two, I see that the largest common factor is just x. And what's left over then is 2x plus 1. From the second group, these two terms, the largest common factor is negative three. So I pull out a negative three, and what's left over is also two x plus one. Which means two x plus one is a common factor between these two terms now. So I've, I've kind of split this four term expression into a two term expression is this, which is one term, and this, which is one term. And between these two terms, there is a common factor of 2x plus 1. So I'll pull the 2x plus 1 out on the right, and I'll be left with x minus 3. This is how you factor quadratics where the lead coefficient is not 1. That'll save you having to use the quadratic formula or compute the square. Um, either of those things would be a waste of time here. You can do this anytime the polynomial, the quadratic, has rational roots. Remember, a rational number is a, a fraction made up of whole numbers. So as long as the, the polynomial has nice roots, roots that are not um, irrational numbers like square root of three or whatever, or um, imaginary, you know, complex non-random numbers, uh, it's an important skill. It's an important skill. And if you want to learn more about it, of course, there's lots of YouTube videos. Um, it's worthwhile to practice this. You'll get some practice in the homework. But if it's not something you've seen before, you may want to practice it a little more. Okay, um, some other useful factoring tricks. I've shown you the difference of squares. We talked about this at the beginning of the term, but I just want to remind you that if you have anything of the form a squared minus b squared, you can always factor this as a minus b times a plus b. Um, so examples of this include like 9 minus 4x squared. I can factor this as a difference of squares because I can think of it as 3 squared minus 2x all squared. So like a here would be 3, b would be 2x, which means this can be factored as 3 minus 2x times 3 plus 2x. Of course, things like you know x squared minus one or x squared minus four, those can all be factored like this as well. 
I'm going to show you some, some slightly less obvious thing. In fact, even less obvious than this, within the real numbers, every positive number is a square. It might not be a perfect square, any square it might not be an integer, but if I wanted to, I could factor x squared minus 3, like this too. Um, I just think of this as you know, x squared minus the square root of 3 squared. 3 certainly is what you get if you square the square root of 3. So according to my difference of squares formula, this is x minus root 3 times x plus root 3. And I'll let you verify that if you foil that back out, you really do get x squared minus 3. So this difference in squares formula is useful, surprisingly useful, uh, in some cases where you might not even think it applies. Going along with this, there is something called a difference in sum and difference of cubes. And kind of how this one starts off as a, a squared minus b squared. Your difference of cubes formula starts off as a cubed minus b cubed. And I'm going to sneak the sum of cubes formula in here as a kind of color change. You'll see in a minute. The way most people remember the difference of cubes formula um, at the start is using an, an acronym called uh, SOAP, S-O-A-P. But the truth is that only tells you the signs. So you have to remember the shape of the formula. So this guy is going to be a minus b times a squared plus a b plus b squared. And if you want to change the minus and the start here to a plus instead, that purple is sufficiently different. Yeah. Um, then this changes to a plus, and this changes to a minus. And again, that acronym is useful because this is the same sign, this is the opposite sign, and this one is always positive. So people remember this as S O. So same, opposite, always positive. It works, um, and it's, a, again, a useful formula. If you have a summary difference of cubes, and many polynomials are that, then you can factor them this way. For example, if I had something like 27 minus x cubed, I can recognize that as 3 cubed minus x cubed. So that's a difference of cubes. So that would be 3 minus x times 3 squared, which is 9. The opposite sign, and then a times b, which is 3x, plus b squared, which is x squared. And if you wanted to factor this further, you'd have to factor that quadratic. Now, I think in this case, that quadratic is kind of nasty. Uh, I think this may not have any real roots. And that's not, not too uncommon. Um, for things like this, to have one real root coming from this factor and then no real roots coming from this factor. And we're going to talk about real roots versus imaginary roots um, next, in fact. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We need to talk about dividing polynomials first. Dividing polynomials is a little bit tricky, so this is, this is the big thing now. All right, so those are my factoring tricks. Um, those are mostly the factoring tricks. There are some others that involve like substituting and trig functions and things like that. But as far as factoring skills that you'll need for calculus, this is it. Just the stuff I have shown you. So. Next is section 3.3 .3 on dividing polynomials. Now, 
And I will be releasing a new homework that has uh, polynomial division in it, um, along with the, the root stuff, whatever it is we get through today. Um, that will be due for you on Monday, in addition to the homework set from earlier in the week. Here's the basic idea. Given any polynomial p of x um, and a polynomial you want to divide it by, which we call the divisor, d of x, one can always find a quotient polynomial called q of x. Uh, now, usually we assume, oh, sorry, my watch just hit me. Uh, one will usually assume that the degree of d is smaller than the degree of p, um, but really the only requirement is that that d is non-zero. So, you know, you can't divide by zero. Um, D is allowed to have roots. It's just that it can't be the zero polynomial, like just straight up zero. There's two ways we can say this. Um, one can find a quotient polynomial q of x and remainder polynomial r of x satisfying, again, two different ways to write this, um, p of x divided by d of x is equal to q of x plus r of x over d of x. So this is like you divide p by d, you get q, plus a remainder term. So maybe maybe P isn't neatly divisible by D, like just like with numbers, right? Like five, you try to divide five by two, five isn't neatly divisible by two. If you want to stay in integer land, um, you, you can't, the quotient is non-integer, but you could say five divided by two is two with a remainder of one. So you could say akin to five divided by two, is equal to two plus one over two. So this would be like, this would be like B, this would be like Q, this would be like R, and this is like B. Um, but the way that algebraists, people who study algebra usually write this, is that you can, can always write P as Q of x times d of x plus r of x. And the neat thing here is the degree of r is always smaller than the degree of um, the degree of r is guaranteed to be smaller than the degree of And now what we're going to do is, given two polynomials, P and D, the original polynomial and the guy you want to divide by, you're going to learn how to do the division, which means you got to come up with the polynomials Q and R. I'm going to show you how to do it through something called long division. And then in certain cases, there will be a, a faster way to do it called synthetic division. All right, so this is where we're going. Second to write. Turns out polynomial division is one of the best ways to kind of search for factors. Uh, if you're in a situation where you can't apply any of our factoring tricks, but you want to factor a polynomial, you can go hunting for factors using a combination of a, a particular theorem um, and long division or synthetic.
Here we go. So you divide polynomials a lot like you divide numbers. This is going to be similar to the long division you learned in second grade. I'm going to show you for examples. So we're going to divide the polynomial p of x, um, call it 6x squared minus 26x plus 12 by the polynomial p of x. Uh, x minus 4. So just like with numbers, I write out this kind of division symbol. The thing you want to divide goes underneath. The thing you're dividing by goes over here on the left. And then the way this is done is at each step, you just pay attention to the lead term. So when I go to take my first step in doing this division, I just look at this guy and at this guy. I don't give a shit about this, and I, at the moment, don't give a shit about this. I just look at this guy and this guy. And I ask, by what must I multiply x in order to get 6x squared? In other words, what is 6x squared on its own divided by x? So what, and, it, and the answer has to be a polynomial. Let me be clear about that. So by what polynomial can I multiply x to get 6x squared? Oh, well, 6x, right? 6x times x is 6x squared. So you put that up there on the top. The thing that shows up upstairs is your quotient. Now to continue, you're going to take this guy and multiply it by this whole thing. So you'll go ahead and distribute 6x over x minus 4. That'll give you 6x squared. And then 6x times negative 4 is minus 24x. And I don't have a constant term here, so I like to write the plus 0. You draw a little line underneath it. So everybody see how this second row here is what you get if you multiply 6x by x minus 4? Just like you do with numbers, right, when you, when you divide numbers. Now you subtract the whole second row from the first row. I encourage you to put the parentheses and the minus sign there. It's easy to make mistakes and forget what the signs. So if I take 6x squared and I subtract from it 6x squared, I get nada. If I take negative 26x and I subtract from it negative 24x, that negative negative is going to make up a plus there. So I'm really looking at negative 26x plus 24x. I get negative 2x. And then 12 minus 0 is 12. That's one kind of loop of the division algorithm, if you will. Start over. Same thing, but now I treat this like my p of x. So I'm going to come over here. I ask, by what must I multiply this lead term in order to get this lead term? We do everything we just did over again. So to turn x into negative 2x, I multiply by the polynomial negative 2. But I write up here minus 2. And then negative 2 times x minus 4 is negative 2x plus 8 line underneath it, put some friends around the second row, and then subtract. By design, the first two terms should always eat each other up. If that doesn't happen, you made a mistake. So yeah, negative 2x minus negative 2x, that's 0. We don't write it. 12 minus 8 is 4. So I put down here a 4. And again, that's another loop done. So I ask, is there any polynomial I can multiply x by in order to get 4? And the answer is no. And that's how you know you're done. That's how you know to stop. There is no polynomial, no non-integer constant times power of x by which I can multiply this to get this. Or if you want to think of it the other way, if you divide this by this, the result is not a polynomial. 4 over x is not a polynomial. So you're done. The piece down here is your remainder. The P 
piece up here, that's your portion. And remember, those are the two pieces we needed to find. You're given the polynomial P and the divisor D. So what we've just discovered, I'll write it both ways, is a 6x squared minus 26x plus 12 divided by x minus 4 is equal to this quotient, 6x minus 2, plus this remainder, 4 over this divisor, x minus 4. I compare that to the, the theorem that we had from the previous page. Each piece is here. p over d equals q plus r over d. And you can check that the degree of r is less than the degree of d. Here, the degree of r, r is a constant, that's a degree zero polynomial, is strictly less than the degree of d, x minus four, which is a degree one polynomial. And you could write this the other way as six x squared minus 26 x plus 12 is equal to, what are those? What order do I have these in? Or is it d times q? q times d. All right, I'll write it in the same way. q times d. 6x minus 2 times x minus 4 plus r, which is 4. These two say the exact same thing. To go from here down to here, you just multiply both sides by x minus 4. Here, the x minus 4 is cancel. You just get 4. Here, you get 6x minus 2 times x minus 4. And on the left, the x minus 4 is cancel. You just get 5. Uh, you'll have homework problems that ask you to do both. They'll ask you for the result in either form. It's actually the bottom form that's really useful when you're trying to factor stuff. The top form, this is really useful down the road when we're going to do something called partial fractions or in Calc 2 um, when you're going to be, again, doing partial fractions to integrate functions. Um, I'm sure there are other applications that are just not jumping out at me at the moment. So this is it. This is your division algorithm. Uh, before I, I do one more example, are there any questions on what we did here, where the pieces came from, anything like that? I have a question. Yeah, what's up? So you're saying that you're going to always factor out that lead coefficient of six on this particular one is six. So it no matter whatever the lead coefficient, that's the one you're going to start with. Um, so we, yeah, in each step, we only pay attention to the lead term. So in my very first step, when I'm trying to figure out, like, how do I begin when I've just got this? I ask, by what must I multiply the lead term here in order to get the lead term here? I ignore this stuff and this stuff at that first step. So by what must I multiply the highest order term here, which is x, in order to get the highest order term here, which is x squared? And that was 6x. That's where this came from. OK. And then in, in, at the start of each little loop, we just look at the, the lead term, the highest order term. Gotcha. And then the other terms, they get involved when we do the distribution, right? The next step is to distribute the 6x, and that's where this came from. Let's look at an example with some higher degree polynomials. So let me try to divide p of x equals 8x to the 4 plus 6x squared minus 3x plus 1 by the divisor, d of x equals 2x squared minus x plus 2. Notice that there's a missing term here, right? I've got an 8x to the 4 and then a 6x squared, but I, I don't have an x cubed term. So that means the x cubed is hiding in there. It's just as a 0x cubed. Um, you'll want to write that in. 
I think it, it really helps keep the organization um, easy to follow. So I'll have under here 8x to the full plus 0x cubed plus 6x squared minus 3x plus 1. And we're going to do the same thing. I begin by looking at the lead term here and the lead term here. And I ask, by what must I multiply 2x squared in order to get 8x to the 4? Well, 8x to the 4 is 4x squared times 2x squared. So up here goes 4x squared. You multiply 4x squared and 2x squared, you get 8x to the 4. Now I'll go ahead and distribute that 4x squared over this whole divisor. So 4x squared times 2x squared by design, that's 8x to the 4. 4x squared times negative x is negative 4x cubed. And now the x cubes line up. If I left out the 0x cubed here, they wouldn't line up. So it'd be a little bit confusing. Then I have 4x squared times 2. Well, that's going to be plus 8x squared. And then there are no lower order terms here. So I'll put plus 0x plus 0. I draw my line underneath. And I subtract the row. This minus this is zero. Zero x cubed minus negative four x cubed is positive four x cubed. Six x squared minus eight x squared is going to be negative two x squared. Negative three x minus zero x is negative three x, and one minus zero is and that's what one loop looks like here, these, these larger polynomials. Now we do it again. So I'm left with this, which I'm now trying to divide by this. So I look at the largest order term here and the largest order term here. By what must I multiply 2x squared in order to get 4x cubed? 2x. So up here, I write plus 2x. That's the next term of my quotient. And then I'll distribute the 2x, just the 2x. 2x times this whole thing. 2x times 2x squared is 4x cubed. 2x times negative x is minus 2x squared. Oh, that's neat. 2x times positive 2 is plus 4x. And then there is uh, no term here that's going to give me a constant, so you're going to write the plus zero. Subtract. 4x cubed minus 4x cubed is zero. That goes away. Negative 2x squared minus negative 2x squared. That's negative 2x squared plus 2x squared. That's also zero, so that goes away. Negative 3x minus 4x is negative 7x. And 1 minus 0 is still 1. And now here, the degree is smaller than the degree here. Right? There is no, no way to multiply this by a polynomial to get this. Um, so I'm done. Let me just write down our answer. So what we've discovered here is that if you take 8x to the 4 plus six x squared, I'm not going to write the zero this time, so I'm just writing down the answer, minus three x plus one, and I divide it by two x squared minus x plus two, what I get is my quotient, this guy, four x squared plus two x plus this remainder term, negative seven x plus one over this divisor, 2x squared minus x plus 2. Or if I wanted to write it in the other form, I would say 8x to the 4 plus 6x squared minus 3x plus 1 is equal to q times d. So that's 4x squared plus 2x times 2x squared minus x plus 2 
plus this remainder, which is minus 7x plus 1. So either of these are, are acceptable ways of writing the answer. Sometimes what well, sign will ask you for one or the other. Just pay attention to what the question is saying. So that's polynomial long division. And it's an important skill. It's a skill that you're going to need through the remainder of this chapter. Um, and you'll use it in a handful of different places in the calculus sequence. There is a faster way. There's a way to do this with less writing. But it only works in a special case. If the polynomial you're trying to divide by your divisor, this thing, or here, this thing, happens to be a linear polynomial, like x minus something or x plus something in particular, you have to put it into that form, then you can do what's called synthetic division, where you don't write the division bar, you don't write any of the x's, you just kind of run the algorithm on the coefficients themselves. So let's let's come back to this guy. Let's come back to this guy here. This works to divide any p of x by divisors of the form, your divisor d of x has to be of the form like x minus some constant. Obviously, x plus a constant works too. You just have to think of it as x minus the negative of that constant. But we always write it like this. So we're going to return to that example. We're going to divide p of x equals 6x squared minus 26x plus 12 by d of x equals x minus 4 using synthetic division. I do require that you learn both algorithms. It's true. Anything you can do with synthetic division, you can do with long division. The converse isn't true. There's lots of stuff you can do with long division that you can't do with synthetic division. And there will be problems on the test where I specify use synthetic division or use long division. It'll be necessary that, that you get comfortable with both. So we just learned that's long division. Here is synthetic division. You begin by writing just the coefficients of p. So here that's 6, negative 26, and positive 12. And then over here, you just write c. So x minus 4, x minus c. I'm just going to write the four. And then the way I was taught, uh, for whatever reason, I kind of like to put this thing here because it just reminds me that I'm doing division. It kind of looks like a division thing. Um, reminds me that I'm like dividing the polynomial represented by this by the polynomial represented by that. You begin by bringing this down a row. Then you multiply this times this. So four times six is 24. Then you add these. Negative 26 plus 24, that's negative 2. Then you multiply this and this. So 4 times negative 2, that's negative 8. That goes over here. And then you add these. So 12 plus negative 8, that's positive 4. The last term here will always be the remainder. And the terms here will be the coefficients of the quotient. 
and they'll be always in order. So my quotient Q of X here is six X minus two. And my remainder R of X is the constant four. And let's check, is that what we found when we did it the other way? Yeah, quotient six X minus two, remainder four. So you can take that information and put it into the form that we wanted. So therefore, 6x squared minus 26x plus 12, when divided by x minus 4, gives this quotient, 6x minus 2, plus the remainder over the divisor, which is 4 over x minus 4. Synthetic division is faster by far. You, just because you're writing so much less, you don't write any of the x's, you only write the coefficients, and you kind of skip a lot of the kind of tedious algebra, you just do arithmetic with the coefficients, but you follow this algorithm, and it's very, very slick. I'm a fan, big fan. There are problems in the sections that follow, sections 3.4, 3.5, where you have to do a lot of polynomial division and you want to do it fast. For that reason, you want synthetic division. Okay. I'd like to do one more example here. Let me see. Uh, one more example using synthetic division. Let's divide p of x equals x cubed minus 7x plus 6 by the divisor polynomial p of x equals x minus 2. Because the thing I'm dividing by, my divisor, is a polynomial of the form x minus a constant, right, a linear polynomial, I can use synthetic division, so I should, because it's faster. The catch is when you write down the coefficients of p of x, just like we did with the long division, you got to insert the missing terms as zeros. So here's what I'm going to do. The coefficients of p are 1. 0, negative 7, 6, right? This is x cubed plus 0x squared minus 7x plus 6. And then remember over here, the thing you put is the root of d of x. That's the way I think of it. It's the number that would make this 0. Or if you prefer, it's the c in x minus c. So if this was x plus 3, you would put a negative 3 here. If this was x minus 7, you would put a positive 7 here. You begin by just bringing this first guy down, and then you multiply these two and write the result over here. So 2 times 1 is 2. And we'll add those. 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 times 2, that goes over here. 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 7 plus 4 is negative 3. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. And negative 6 plus positive 6 is 0. And this brings us to a beautiful place. The remainder is 0. Think back to dividing numbers. What does it mean when I say doing long division by numbers, the remainder is zero? Oops. It can go in there evenly. Yeah. So what does that, so let's take that and still talking about numbers. If I say that three goes into, you know, 21 evenly, what does that say about 21? It's on. Not necessarily. There are even numbers that are divisible by three also, right? Like six. Um, but divisible by three, 
or that three is a factor of 21. All right, that's what it means to say one thing is divisible by another. It means that the thing you try to divide by is a factor of the original thing. So what we just discovered is that this polynomial is divisible by this polynomial because the remainder is zero. So what does that mean about this polynomial? What can you tell me for sure is a factor of this polynomial? X minus two. Hell yes. You see why this would be useful in factoring? It tells you a factor. Now, now you gotta guess and check this guy. That's the trick. And I've got a special theorem for you for that, but we're not there yet. So uh, here's the result. Therefore, x cubed minus seven x plus six over x minus two. Remember these are the coefficients of the quotient. So Q of X here, um, I'm dividing a degree three polynomial by a degree one polynomial. The result will always be a degree two polynomial. So you see three numbers here. So the coefficients are one, two, and negative three. That means that's one X squared plus two X minus three. So in other words, X cubed minus seven X plus six divided by X minus two is X squared plus two X minus three. And we could write this in the other way as X cubed minus seven X plus six is equal to X squared plus two X minus three times x minus 2. And you see what we've done here? We've started factoring. If I wanted to continue factoring, I could. This is now a quadratic. I know how to factor quadratics, so I don't even need to return to any more division tricks. If I wanted to factor this cubic, which by the way, we wouldn't have been able to do yesterday, right? This, this is a hard polynomial to factor. There aren't any uh, common factors for me to pull out to get started. It's not at all easy to see. But now that we know x minus 2 divides this thing cleanly and the quotient, we just multiply both sides by x minus 2 to get this. And if I needed to continue factoring, I would factor this. But that wasn't the problem. The problem just said do the division. So I did the division. Okay. So what we just said is if the remainder when you divide by a factor like x minus c is zero, then x minus c is a factor. It goes deeper than that. But what does it mean to be a factor? So if I tell you something has a factor, a polynomial has a factor of x minus two, remember the TFAE from yesterday, the following are equivalent. Does anybody remember? What could I deduce from this? The fact that x minus two is a factor of this polynomial tells me what? Why do we look for factors? Why do we factor polynomials? To find solutions? Yeah, uh, solutions to the equation p of x equals zero, aka roots or x-intercepts, right? So the fact that x minus two is a factor, which we learned through division because the remainder was zero, tells me that x equals two is a root or a zero of this polynomial p. In other words, p of two is equal to zero. Doesn't that mean like there's, I, never mind. I was about to say something dumb. Mm -hmm. I was like, doesn't that mean that there's no remainders? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> so in this case, p of two we just learned is zero. And the remainder when we divided p of x by x minus two was zero. Here's the theorem. And I'm actually going to prove this for you guys. The proof is not that hard. Oops, bad pen. Oh, that's the good pen. Yeah. The remainder when a polynomial P of X is divided by 
x minus c is equal to p of c. And this is actually a big, fat, awesome, important theorem. It's not that it's so useful for detecting roots. It's that it's really useful when you're trying to plug numbers into a polynomial. Instead of a 2, if I make this 20, this doesn't really get any harder, does it? All you ever have to do is multiply by a number and add numbers. But if I wanted to plug 20 into here, I would have to cube 20 and then multiply 20 by 7, then subtract those and add 6. That's kind of a pain in the ass. But this says, if you want to find p of something, just divide p of x by x minus that thing. And you should do the synthetic division because it's easy. Whatever that remainder comes out to, that's p of that thing. Let's check. What did I say? p of 20, right? Find p of 20. This is called the remainder theorem, by the way. It's a big deal. It's named. Um, I haven't shared this with you guys, but one of the things I do here at Santa Fe is I coach our competitive math team. I take a team to the Math Olympics every year. I take a team to the Integration B at UF every year, every now and then up to MIT for their Integration B. Um, and this theorem is one of those that we use a lot in those competitions. And those kids are, are at a pretty high level. Uh, but this theorem from pre-calculus shows up all the time. So let's find p of 20 using the remainder theorem. So that should be the remainder I get when I divide p of x by x minus 20, which is the synthetic division that I've set up here. Bring down the 1, multiply by 20. That's 20. Add these. 20 plus 0 is 20. 20 times 20. Oh, I do have to square. OK, 2 times 2 is 4. 10 times 10 is 100. So this is 400. Add these. 400 minus 7. What is that? Uh, that's 393. All right, we are going to get to a place where the arithmetic isn't super nice. But 393 times 20. Oh, well, let's see. So. That's the same as uh, 400 times 20 minus 7 times 20. So 4 times 2 is 8. That would be 8,000 minus 7 times 20. 7 times 2 is 140. So 8,000 minus 140. Well, 8,000 minus 100 is uh, 8,000 minus 100 is 7,900. And then I need to subtract an additional. Oh, damn it. I hate that I used an example here and then the arithmetic got away with me, but I'm going to be lazy. 393 times 20. We'll do it here. My point is that it's still easier than plugging in 7,860. And then we would add these guys and we get 7,866. So this process, even though it's not super nice, you still have a little bit of unwieldy arithmetic. Um, still easier than plugging into this. And if we want to check, p of x is x cubed minus 7x plus 6. What's p of 20? Hey, 7,866. Thank goodness. So. Right. Just through the remainder theorem, we're able to, to determine this. It's also really nice when you're trying to plug big fractions into a polynomial. Um, because again, you'd have to raise those fractions to large powers and then have common denominators. But here, you don't have to do any of that. It's, it's much nicer. You might have some common denominator work, but generally, this is easier than plugging in. All right, here's the proof. It's like two lines. Proof of the theorem. By the division algorithm, we can write p of x over x minus c 
is equal to q of x plus r of x over x minus c, where the degree of r is less than the degree of d. Here, the degree of the polynomial d, and d is x minus c, so the degree of d is one, which means the degree of r has to be smaller than one, means the degree of r has to be zero, so r is a constant. Now, if I multiply through by x minus c, I get p of x is equal to q of x times x minus c plus r. And I'm just going to write r now because I know r is a constant. If you take this and you plug x equals c, we get p of c is equal to q of c times c minus c plus r. But c minus c is 0. So p of c is equal to q of c times 0 plus r. Well, q of c, whatever q of c is, I don't care. I'm multiplying it by 0. So this is just r. And that's it. That's the proof. p of c is equal to r. Again, a surprisingly useful thing. Surprisingly useful thing. Okay. Uh, we're almost done with the section here. There's just one or two little things. Um, if I specify the roots of a polynomial, how do you find the polynomial? This is going to lean again on that TFAE thing. What, what what do you mean by how you find a column? Because you can find it on the graph as well, like the solution to a polynomial. Well, what if I give you the solutions, but I don't give you the function itself? Can you tell me what the function is? You would have to. Um... Can you use the quadratic formula? Oh, I didn't think about that. Would you multiply the solutions? So we're working here in, in greater generality than quadratics. Um, I want to assume that this, this polynomial could be degree three, four, or five, maybe even bigger. Um, so, so the quadratic formula isn't going to be helpful. But let me, um, let me show you what I mean. So maybe I tell you, um, find, find a polynomial. of degree four with roots. So I'm going to give you the roots. I'm going to give you the x-intercepts, and I want you to tell me the polynomial. Um, maybe negative three, zero, one, and five. Would it be like x plus three, x minus one, X plus five and then an X on the outside because it's zero. Yes, very good. Jada nailed it. You guys remember from the TFAE theorem, the following our equivalent theorem that we used yesterday. Finding roots is equivalent to finding factors. If you know a factor, that tells you a root. Well, that works the other way too, right? That's what we mean by equivalent, logically equivalent. If you know a factor, you know a root. That means also, if you know a root, then you know a factor. There's a catch here. There's more than one degree four polynomial with these roots, but I'm going to work this out and then show you what that catch is. So one possible answer. And I want to emphasize that this is just one of the many possible answers is P of X equals X minus negative three times X minus zero times X minus one times x minus 5. These things have to be multiplied together. Remember, that's what it means to be a factor. The well, factor has a special meaning. It's not just a piece. It's a multiplicative piece. 
And from each one of these roots, I just have x minus that thing. All right, that was our TF8. C is a root means x minus C is a factor. X minus C is a factor means C is a root. It goes both ways. So one such polynomial is x plus 3 times x minus 0 is just x times x minus 1 times x minus 5. And you don't have to multiply this out. I know this is degree 4. Why do I know this is degree 4? Because here's a multiplicity 1 factor. Here's a multiplicity 1 factor. Here's a multiplicity 1 factor. And here's a multiplicity 1 factor. Remember the other result from yesterday. The degree is always the sum of the multiplicities. If you want to multiply it out, you could. But on a test, for example, it would not be a good use of your time. So this is it. This is an answer. This works great. Let's come back over to this. One possible answer. How is it possible that there's another polynomial with these roots and of degree 4? Why am I saying one possible answer? Why isn't this the only answer? Because you have your degree and you know your roots. Well, so the degree is fixed at four. But my claim is that even, even keeping that like that, um, I could find another polynomial. Maybe I'm not answering your or responding to your statement there. What was the thought? Or maybe let me say it like this. If I multiply this whole thing by two, is that still a polynomial of degree four? Yes. Does it have the same roots? No. I mean, yes and no. It no. would. I mean, it yeah, would. Yeah, it because it'll have the same polynomial about. factors, right? So yeah. another possible answer here would be 2 times x plus 3 times x times x minus 1 times x minus 5. Or p of x equals negative x plus three times x times x minus one times x minus five. Um, in general, any polynomial of the form p of x equals a constant, I'll call it a times each of these factors, x plus three times x times x minus 1 times x minus 5 would work. Where a is a constant. In other words, <clears throat> the information that you would need to add to this in order to have a unique answer, right? In order for there to be one and only one correct answer, is something that determines the lead coefficient. This number a out front here, this would be your lead coefficient. Because if you multiply all this stuff out, the very first term would be like x to the 4, and then, I don't know, something times x to the 3, and then something times x to the 2, and so on. Um, but I could multiply that whole thing by a, by a number and it won't change the roots. It'll just stretch the graph up or down, right? And when you stretch a graph up and down, the roots don't move. I'll show you what I mean. We'll use this exact example. Actually, let me use a, an example that this is going to be big y values. Let me use an example of smaller y values. First, I'm going to hold here for a second in case anybody's still writing. I'm going to flip to Desmos in about 10 seconds. All right, here we go.
Here's a polynomial with three roots. Each of them are of multiplicity one. The x plus one factor gives me this root at negative one. The x factor gives me this root at zero. And the x minus one factor gives me this root at one comma zero. Now, watch what happens. Please. If I multiply by two, or if I multiply by negative three, or if I multiply by seven, you see all of these guys have the same roots because they all have the same polynomial factors. So specifying the roots doesn't completely determine the polynomial. It only determines it up to the lead coefficient. Which means the types of questions you'll most likely be asked to answer aren't just going to say this. They're going to say, find a polynomial of degree four with roots, blah, 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 and some other bit of information that you need to satisfy. So let me throw in an extra bit of information for us to satisfy on this example. And I'll show you how to solve for that lead coefficient. Basically, what you're going to do is just what I showed there. You're going to write down p of x equals a, or some whatever letter you want to use, but not x, some constant times those factors. Um, and then you'll use the extra information to solve for, for a. So if you find the polynomial of degree four with roots, what do we have? Negative three, zero, one, and five. And having coefficient of x cubed, negative six. Negative six as the coefficient of x cubed. So it's that the stuff that comes after the and here, which is going to help me figure out the constant a. And that's what will kind of uniquely determine my polynomial. What we're getting at here is something called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says the roots of a polynomial determine that polynomial up to a constant multiple. So here's how you do this. You write down p of x equals a times, and then your factors, which were x plus 3, x, x minus 1, and x minus 5. Now, they might have said, instead of telling us the coefficient of x cubed, they might have said having a certain y-intercept, or having they might have been nice and just said having lead coefficient something. Um, but they have to give some other bit of information. They might have said, you know, p of 6 is 3. Any other bit of information will be enough to determine this constant a. But you have to allow for this. Don't just write down the factors. Remember that there could be lots of polynomials that satisfy that. Um, and in order to determine one uniquely, you have to allow for that, that constant multiple. Next, I need to multiply all this out, which is a bit of a headache, but we're going to do it. So I'll start. I'll go right to left. We're going to foil these. This is a times x plus 3 times x times, if I follow this, this is x squared minus x minus 5x plus 5. So that's x squared minus 6x plus 5. Then I'll distribute the x. So this is a times x plus 3 times x cubed minus 6x squared plus x. And now I need to FOIL these. It's not really FOILing because this has three terms and this has two terms. So just think of it like distribution. This is a times, there's a little bracket here, x times this thing plus 3 times this thing. I want you to review this algebra carefully and make sure you understand every single step.
So from here to here, I'm distributing x plus 3 over this guy. I'm going to take everything here and multiply it by x. That's this. Then I'm going to take everything here and multiply it by 3. That's this. And because the sign between x and 3, the symbol there is a plus, this is the plus. It's kind of the reverse factor by grouping thing. Now, in each of those, I do my little distribution. Then I combine like terms. So this is x to the 4 minus 6x cubed plus 5x squared plus 3x cubed minus 18x squared plus 15x. And now I look for any like terms I can combine. There's x to the 4. There's only one of those. What about x cubed? I've got one here. Got one here. So negative 6x cubed plus 3x cubed is minus 3x cubed. x squared, so I've got one here, and I've got one here. So there's five of them there, minus 18 of them there. That's minus 13x squared. And then the only other term that I haven't accounted for yet is the plus 15x. So finally, all the polynomials that have these roots and are of degree 4 would be of the form ax to the 4 minus 3ax cubed minus 13ax squared plus 15ax, distributing the a. Now we're almost done. They said negative 6 should be the coefficient of x cubed. So what's the coefficient of x cubed here? Well, here's the x cubed term. And it's important that we multiplied everything out and gathered all the terms. Otherwise, I wouldn't really know. They're telling me the coefficient, which here is negative 3a, should be equal to negative 6. So this thing should be equal to this thing. Problem says. of x cubed should be negative 6, which means negative 3a is equal to negative 6, which means a is 2. Now we're done. Therefore, p of x, um, I would go back and write it in the factored form, because that's the nice way to write it. P of x is 2 times, I'll put the x out front, times x plus 3 times x minus 1 times x minus 5. And there's your final answer. Okay. These make for very nice test problems. Hint, nudge, wink, whatever. I give you the degree and the roots, and then one other bit of information. And I ask you to find me the unique polynomial having those features. And the thing that people forget is to account for the lead coefficient, because this could be whatever. Remember our picture here. There's lots of polynomials that have any specified set of roots. In fact, there's infinitely many. But if you want to narrow it down to one of them, then you got to give me the bit of information I need to solve for that lead coefficient. OK. The good news is that's all I want to teach you guys about dividing polynomials. Um, the bad news is that we still have two sections relating polynomials, but we're out of time for today. So I am going to go ahead and end class here. Next time, we're going to talk about the real zeros of polynomials, and we're going to talk about complex zeros or roots of polynomials and something called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, neither of those sections are especially hard. I think we'll move through both of them easily on Monday of next week. Um, 
But yeah, that's it. So you've got a homework set that's open. Um, that homework set really only goes through 3.2. Maybe I'll be gentle on you guys and not, not publish another homework for now. I'll just let you work on that one. Next week, when we finish 3.4 and 3.5, I'll throw those into the, the first homework set for that week. We'll be kind of back on our regular schedule. Uh, any questions for me before I let you all go for the day? Alrighty, then I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting here. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your day, safe weekend, and I'll see everybody back on.